Masters of Creativity today from wherever you are around the world, whether Italy or Istanbul, Sao Paulo or Minneapolis. We're glad to have you join us. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce a couple of amazing practitioners from the K-12 education space. And you might be wondering, K-12 education, hang on, I'm an executive in a corporate setting. Um, one of the things that we've been delighted to discover as we've hosted these sessions over the last nine months or so is the extent to which insights are portable across disciplinary boundaries. One of the early discoveries as we launched this series on behalf of the executive education team is how many people from the education uh, sector ended up coming and came out of the woodwork interested in the tools that we've been teaching in the exec ed program for professionals at Stanford. And so we actually started having sessions that are geared towards educators as well. And last month we had an incredible session geared towards educators that we in the exec ed team said, wow, those are phenomenally useful tools and portable back the other direction. We feel like professionals, regardless of context, whether education or otherwise, should learn about these incredible tools. So it's with that by way of introduction that it's my pleasure to introduce two of my colleagues from the D School who've de developed some really amazing tools in the context of K-12 that we believe are useful to you, whatever your discipline or industry happens to be. Uh, first, Mark Chun has spent his career in education. He's taught, he's ran professional development, conducted research, made grants as a program officer at charitable foundations. Uh, but he says it was his work as a design fellow at the D School that, in which he developed the Posits, Positive Deviance Project that he's going to be sharing about today with his colleague, Devin Young. Um, he holds three master's degrees, I think because he's a slacker, sociology, policy analysis, and education, and he earned his doctorate in education at Stanford. He completed a postdoc in sociology and education at Columbia University Teachers College, and he enjoys escape rooms, the performing arts, and long walks on the beach. We are delighted to have an expert of Mark Chun's caliber joining us today. I'm also pleased to introduce you to Devin Young. She's an educator and designer who operates with a deep belief in the power of empathy to drive change. She currently runs Designing Learning, an educational consulting organization that supports K-12 schools in bringing design methods and mindsets into their teaching and learning practices. Previously, she worked at SFUSD Middle School, spending six years as program manager and learning experience designer for the D-Scale's K-12 lab, where she helped launch initiatives like Shadow Student Challenge, which is an amazing program if you haven't heard about it, it's worth looking it up, and the Discover Design Thinking Workshop series. She's got a bachelor's degree from the University of San Francisco and a master's from UNC Chapel Hill, Go Tar Heels, except when you play the Longhorns. Uh, when she's not teaching and designing alongside educators, you can find her doing yoga, hiking, or dancing to live music at one of the many concert venues in the Bay Area. Together, they work with educators around the world to leverage design in their communities. And today, we've invited them to share the tools they've developed there so that you can leverage them in your community, regardless of your context. Can you please join me in giving a warm Masters of Creativity fireworks applause welcome to Mark Chun and Devin Young. Before we dive into the work that we've been doing over the last year or so, um, I want to share a little bit of history about uh, positive deviance and uh, kind of the framework and how it, how it came to be. So um, the concept of positive deviance, um, which we use interchangeably with community-led problem solving, um, was first noted in uh, nutrition literature research back, way back in the 1960s. Um, so it wasn't kind of further developed. It was just first noted in that literature research uh, in 1960. And then in 1989, uh, the Tufts, Tufts University School of Nutrition Science and Policy began publishing some studies related to positive deviance. Um, and this this just basically kind of identified a few key area, a few uh, kind of key areas where they saw that deviant behavior. They saw some kind of out potential outliers when it came to the, the field of nutrition. Um, in 1989 and 1990, uh, Professor Marion Zeitlin, who's also from Tufts University, uh, they, uh, first uh, released a collection of studies um, around the world that identified uh, well-nourished children from poor families, and she labeled them as positive deviants. So first kind of naming um, individuals as those outliers, as those positive deviants. 
um, because somehow against the same hardships and context of other student of other children in um, her research, they were thriving in a vulnerable population with severe nutritional constraints. So while um, Zeitlin uh, identified the enabling factors that made these positive deviants successful, uh, she did not lay out meaningful action steps so that communities could adopt these same practices. Um, and that's where Marian, uh, Jerry and Monique Cernan came in. So in 1991, uh, Zeitlin's piece kind of laid the, gr the, the groundwork for uh, a positive deviance framework for action, uh, which was developed by the, the Cernans during a particularly difficult work uh, assignment with Save the Children, uh, which is a global humanitarian aid organization for kids. Um, and so this is the process that they developed um, as a way of kind of taking that notion of identifying outliers and learning from those outliers, uh, learning best practices and strategies to use, and then being able to apply it in communities. So it's a five step process. The first is to identify that problem, an intractable problem that um, for some reason um, it, it's been around for forever and all of the, the attempts you've made to solve that problem have just not worked. You've not found a way to kind of solve, to lick that problem. Um, so once you've identified that problem, you then determine the presence of outliers, right? You say, looking at data, where are those people who are on the uh, kind of the positive end of the spectrum that for some reason, with no, uh, given no additional resources, they found a way to be successful, um, more successful than their peers. Uh, once you kind of identify those outliers, you then discover um, those uncommon but successful behaviors and strategies. So what are they actually doing? What is the what what are the things that they're doing? What are the things that they're saying or how are they acting in their own lives that's enabled them to um, be these positive deviants? And then from there, you then introduce it back to the community and figure out ways to enable community members to practice these behaviors um, so that they could then take that on as their own behavior. From there, it's about monitoring and evaluating the impact so that it can impact, so it can influence and um, uh, influence and change your kind of dissemination and scaling plan in communities. So this process, um, I want to I want to first tell explain this process a little bit deeper um, via a case study that uh, was used by the the Sternans to really flesh out this positive deviance framework for action, and was the first real case where um, this 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 idea of learning from outliers um, through this this framework was successfully used, and um, so. Th this is from uh, their work assignment with Save the Children um, in rural Vietnam. And so just to give you a little bit of background on uh, how this how this came to be um, in around 1991, 1992, um, around two thirds of all children between the ages of one and four living in rural Vietnam villages were um, identified as malnourished by the Vietnamese government. There were lots of NGOs and government initiatives that had provided food and support but once those NGOs left or once the programs ended, the gains were lost. There was no kind of follow through and there was no real um, scale, scale of scalability. And so the government was kind of at a loss of what to do. They had not been able to find a solution, although they had tried many, many different things. Uh, so when they turned to save the children, they had a really clear mandate. They wanted to find a sustainable, large scale solution that was based on local resources and expertise and would show results within six months. Um, so the Sternans were, you know, when, as they were figuring out what they would do and what would be their, their first step uh, working with this community, they decided to kind of test out their framework and see what would happen if they uh, started to learn from um, and practice behaviors from the positive deviance within the rural uh, communities, rather than trying to fix the negative outliers, which is the more traditional approach to problem solving. So just to kind of go back to the process that I just walked through, this is how it kind of played out um, through, through this case studies. Um, so the Sternans and, um, a uh, and a ground team of uh, local Vietnamese uh, community members kind of made up the design team for this work and they began experimenting. So they had already identified the problem, right? And that was the, the two thirds um, uh, popul population of malnourished children. So they first then decided to how can we, how can we identify these this presence of outliers? So they began talking to people in the community and saying, are there any families here whose children are healthy? Not saying, let me talk to the, the families whose children are, are malnourished, but saying, what about, let's look at the flip of that. Where are there children who are existing within this community who aren't malnourished, children who are already healthy? And there were families. So they went and they talked to those families. They sat with them, they observed them, they decided to, again, like in the step three, discover what are those outlier behaviors? What are those strategies, those bright spots that enabled them to be successful given no additional resources and the same context as everyone else? 
And what they what they learned was that the caregivers um, of those families were adding extra food like shrimp, crab and leaves to their children's meals. Uh, these meal supplements were available to everyone, but they were not widely being fed to young children because there was a cultural stigma that was dictating that these items were inedible. So again, um, this solution was born from data uh, to find those who are already beating the odds and discovering what they were what they were already doing, and it drew on local expertise. So it wasn't bringing in experts from outside to tell them this is what you need to be doing. It was learning from people within the community who are already being who are already successful. So once they found out that that's what the the, the positive outliers, the bright spots were doing, they then um, they worked with the, the the team on the ground to figure out how to allow how to get community members not just to share the ideas and share what what they found, but how to get them to practice that. Um, they basically worked alongside uh, the families and they had the caregivers who had the healthy children go into different houses and different communities and actually cook alongside these caregivers, um, allow them to come and observe and, and learn from them about what they were doing and how it had resulted in their, in their healthy children. Um, they encouraged, the community members encouraged each other to start trying this, right? Just try it out and see what happens. And then the rest, the rest of the community was able to see that it was resulting in positive outcomes for their kids. And so they started to adopt it widely and it started to kind of really take hold and become a best practice, a bright spot that started to scale across their community. Um, so over the course of uh, six months, they were they, they saw a huge increase um, uh, in, in, in uh, kind of working with those malnourished children. And at the end of six months, 40 percent of those children who are identified as at malnourished uh, were rehabilitated. And so this process after six months was seen as successful. The government said, great, this is something we're going to take on and adopt widely across all of our rural villages. And after five years of practice, they had successfully rehabilitated 93% of malnourished, uh, malnourished children. So this was um, the first time that uh, they, they really they really tried this out in a community and saw, saw really deep success. And so it was clear that they had something here. There was something here that was really special and interesting that they wanted to keep uh, keep working on. And so basically, uh, when, when you think about positive deviance, it really is about that. It's about community led problem solving, right? It's about the premise. It's founded on the premise that there's one, at least one person within a community who has the same resources as everyone else. But for some reason, they've already solved the problem. They found a way against all odds to, you know, fix that thing or to meet that goal or to do something that enabled them to seek success when no one else had. Um, this individual or bright spot is um, an outlier. So in a statistical sense, they're an exception, they're a bright spot, someone whose outcome deviates from the norm. And what you'll find is that these bright spots generally don't know that they're bright spots. These caregivers who had these healthy children, they didn't know that what they were doing was anything really special or different. They were just doing that because it felt natural and they had seen success. So it wasn't something where they immediately, they immediately know that they're special or they're a bright spot. Uh, sometimes this process enables you to really kind of bring visibility to those folks in your community who are doing something really exceptionally well. Um, once that unique solution is discovered and understood, it can be adopted by the wider community and transform many lives. When you think about the risk factor of uh, adopting these type of solutions, it's really low because you already know that the solution works because it's already been working for years, for months, for decades. Um, it just hasn't necessarily been kind of identified and pulled up as a bright spot. So the 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 kind of risk factor in in kind of adopting new solutions really isn't there because you're learning from people around you rather than trying to learn from someone who's coming in and telling you what to do. So uh, this quote right here um, led led uh, the Sternins and led uh, many of the folks who kind of initially designed uh, the positive deviance framework to realize that the way to scale this program and this process was not through lectures and discussions, but by kind of finding new ways to practice the positive deviant behaviors. And we were really inspired by, by this process. Um, but our area of expertise is not in the medical field. It's not in the nutrition field or the science field. Our area of expertise is in K-12 education. Um, our, so when we started hearing about this positive deviance work in this framework, we immediately started thinking, how could this start? How, how could we adapt, adapt and adopt this for our K-12, our, our K-12 processes? Um, because uh, we, we come from the D-Schools K-12 lab. So 
our, our work um, in, in the K-12 lab really focuses on obliterating opportunity gaps in elementary and secondary education by designing new, more equitable models and sharing design approaches with students and with educators. Uh, we work with, ed with educators and with students through developing um, opportunities to help them kind of practice these design and design thinking mindsets and methodologies so that they can apply it back to their own work. And we build tools and resources um, and experiences that, that help educators kind of shift their mindsets and behaviors to take on uh, new innovative work that can help drive their equity work forward within their schools. Um, and most importantly, and connected to, to the work that we're, we've been talking about, is that one, one big part of the work that we do in the K-12 lab is around cultivating networks that are equipped to make change in, this, in their communities. Our work is really not about us coming in and telling people what to do, it's really about helping uh, school communities figure out what's the best way to uh, drive improvement and innovation within their own school communities. So as we, you know, again, started exploring and understanding this process more, we started, we, we kept asking ourselves, what would this process look like in K-12 education and in the context of design? Because um, through the history of positive deviance, it had been adopted quite widely across uh, like I said, the medical, the nutrition, um, in, in other industries, but it hadn't really taken off in K-12 education, which just seems like, like a really a, a puzzling thing. This just seems like a really obvious solution, a really obvious process that would uh, be really attractive to educators. We took on the traditional design approach, which is super powerful and super helpful, but we started by often thinking, what's wrong here? So what are the challenges here? We try to find the underlying root causes of the problem. Oftentimes we might reach out to experts to help us find solutions. And then we, as we scale them, it's top down, outside in. And so as Devin mentioned, what we, we paused and we thought, well, what if we did the exact opposite? What's another tool that we can have in our tool belt? And let's start by doing the sort of orthogonal approach. And so what we did in this work is instead of asking what's wrong here, we ask what's right here. So a true asset-based approach. We're really thinking through what strengths of this community already have. Um, instead of thinking about the root causes, we begin with analysis of the demonstrably successful solutions. What are the bright spots? And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. And so this is the notion that those closest to the problem are already closest to the solution. So what can we do and learn from the community? Um, instead of thinking about solutions that can be found by experts, as Devin mentioned, we can find solutions internally by people just like us with the same culture, same resources. How are they already solving the problem? So that's like the way in which we can do this. And then if we try to get it out into the community, as Devin just shared, instead of top down, outside in, it's down, up, inside out. And so like, what can we learn if we take on this approach? So then what we did is we thought about... Um, K-12 education, and we know that there are a lot of systemic factors that we have to deal with. So we're not denying that. So we still need to do a lot of our hard work to make sure we're taking away a lot of these structural impediments, ways in which the system is unfairly um, created and sustained, such that leaves a lot of folks out. We totally need to do that. But in the short term, we also are thinking, while we're taking on those big challenges, what can we do right now to help the, help the students who are facing challenges immediately? So that was like our ways in which we think these two things complement one another. So um, now I wanna share a second case study about increasing access to higher education. And this came from a class that I co-taught with Laura McBain, who's the co-director of the K-12 lab, and Ben Daly, who's the president of the High Tech High Graduate School of Education. So the three of us co-taught a class about a year ago, and we wanna take a lot of these ideas and start to apply them to K-12 education. So um, we started, thinking about access to higher education. And we do know that, especially for many students further some opportunity, financial aid is a key way in which a key process to help students to have access to and succeed and, and remain in higher education. And so we looked for a key choke, choke point, a real intractable problem. And we thought about the financial aid paperwork. So the free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA, to look to that, because in the news, we had seen a lot of coverage noting that the completion rate had dropped and this can really spell disaster for low-income students if they're not able to get financial aid. So we started there. What can we understand about that piece? So. Just as a thought exercise with our students, we said, well, let's imagine that we're just a consortium of five schools. Let's keep it really small. And they all wanted to get every single student to complete the FAFSA. And let's say we went out and collected those data about the current um, completion rate. And we saw data such as these. 
So we saw the split. Now, like uh, initially at the beginning of the class, we'd ask our students, like, what should we do? Where should we go first? What should we focus on? And they all said, oh, we should go to that school where it's only 14% completion rate because we need to figure out what's going wrong there and help them. But then again, we tried the exact opposite because, well, what if we went to the school with 85% and learned what's going well there? So what are the success stories that we can learn from this other community? So that's what we did with our students. And so we, um, on the next slide. Thanks. Oh, so then we, we actually collected the data. And so we worked with a bunch of schools in Southern California, just starting somewhere. We actually broke them out between small schools and large schools, just because there seemed to be some big differences there. And we just asked, what's the completion rate for the FAFSA? And so you can see them on the, on the vertical axis is the percent of completion rate. And you can see that there's a spread, that there are like some schools getting more, some students getting fewer students to complete the FAFSA. We did a a statistical uh, analysis here, and it's called a p-chart. Uh, no need to worry about the details, but you can see those ones that are above that top dotted line, like that are circled in red. Those are the outliers. Like something is happening there where they're able to get more of their students to complete the FAFSA. And so our students went out to these schools to find like, well, what are you doing? And the remarkable thing, the schools that's getting like those high returns, some of them had no idea, just as Devin said, that they were doing any better than anybody else. They go, oh, you mean everybody doesn't get 80 some percent of the students to complete it? That's an aha. And we also learned some of them were doing things that were so simple um, that anyone else can do them. So for example, one school, what they were doing um, is they were just backing up the deadline. The deadline for the FAFSA is June 30th every year. And as you know, that's oftentimes that's school's already out for the academic year. It's hard to catch up with students. So they were just backing up the deadline. They told the kids the FAFSA deadline was April, end of April, April 30th. And so they had a chance to catch all those kids who didn't complete it. And so they have a chance to get them to turn it in before the actual deadline. This is a solution they came up with. This is something that literally every other school said, oh my gosh, I can do that too, because it doesn't cost anything else. Someone just like me, with the same resources as me, came up with a great solution and I can do that as well. So the key here was like, there are great bright, spot, bright spots out there. And we did not need to bring in a consultant. We didn't need to um, do a lot of like extra design work. Like let's start by seeing what's already working within the community. Through this case study, we realized that um, you know, the positive deviance process, this approach could be used in K-12 education successfully. They were able to find a bright spot that was immediately making a, kind of an impact and a change for these students. And so then we've started asking ourselves a few more questions now that we knew that it works. How could we support school and district communities in using this approach to solve their own intractable problems? And also complete that process along a timeline that works for busy practitioners, as we know, Educators are very, very busy and have a lot of external and internal factors that are impacting schools right now, especially coming right back from um, after a pandemic or during a pandemic. And um, could we help them to unveil more bright spots within schools, bright spots like to Mark's point that weren't these, you know, wild and crazy ideas that just seemed like totally out there. But these, you know, surface these, these, these ideas that you might hear and be like, oh, yeah, that's really obvious. But might but could be something that could lead to some really really deep wide scalable change uh, within the school communities, and so we decided to try something. Um, and so this is our third and final case study, um, and this is um, basically um, a, a still an ongoing prototype, one that we're um, we're just kind of at the at the almost tail end of. Um, but what we've been doing over the last uh, few months is running a professional development experience for educators. Um, around this community-led problem-solving approach. And um, I know I said in the beginning that we use the term community-led problem-solving and positive deviance interchangeably. And that's because um, through some of our, through lots of our research with, with educators is we realized that the, the, the term positive deviance and deviance in particular has a really not negative connotation for educators and kind of labeling someone as having deviant behavior, even if it is on you know, the positive deviant behavior is sometimes still seen as a negative thing. So we decided to just kind of reframe the term to community-led problem solving for the purpose of this professional development, but it is the same positive deviance process that uh, we've been talking about for this whole presentation. And so through this work, um, we, we basically, we, we started back in the spring and began kind of building out some different tools and some different resources to help ed educators, some educators that had experience um, with 
design thinking, some that had no experience with design thinking, to start to play around with um, this notion of positive deviance and bright spot seeking. And um, from that, that learning in the spring, we decided to basically try and, and develop a, a nine week virtual course for K-12 educators that was focused on using this process to solve intractable problems within their school communities. And uh, we launched that back in September. We just finished um, that nine week course, uh, gosh, two weeks ago. Um, and we're right now kind of in the process of closing that up with our school teams. And essentially we had the school teams do a sprint um, through the process. So we asked them to kind of come in and apply for this program if they had a problem in one of these four areas, um, assessment, belonging, civic engagement, or culturally responsive teaching. And again, having this kind of focused, um, this focused uh, intractable problem space allowed us to really go deep in kind of the testing and the prototypes of these, type, of these different kind of resources, tools, and learning experiences that we were developing. So again, this was the process that we that we used um, through this nine week course. We had um, we had educators who logged into Zoom um, weekly on Tuesdays, and we had a two hour uh, virtual learning session with them um, synchronously, where we would walk them through each of these different steps and uh, share with them newly developed tools and resources that we had designed for the the use in this project that was that were inspired by research inspired by the previous case studies that we had kind of identified and also some new and novel things that we had developed alongside educators um, back in the springtime. So we uh, took them through uh, this work and had them um, essentially identify an intractable problem, use data to seek out those outlier behaviors, kind of identify like this data might look like student attendance data, assessment data, uh, teacher retention data, whatever type of data was related to their um, intractable problem, and then find those outliers, those students, those educators, those school support staff who were, um, you know, for some reason uh, succeeding when no one else in their school had been able to, and then go figure out what they're doing. What are the uncommon behaviors and strategies that enable them to be these positive deviants, these outliers? And this looked like doing empathy interviews, um, which those of you who are familiar with design thinking, might this all might sound quite familiar to you, but they conducted empathy interviews with students to learn more about like, what does this problem actually feel like and look like it from the student lens, from the student perspective that allowed them to, you know, again, open up their ideas about who these positive outliers might be. Once they use the data and those empathy interviews to um, identify those outliers, they uh, went and they shadowed the outliers. They sat in on their classrooms. They, you know, observed them during their teaching. They were a fly on the wall and tried to see like, what is the thing that they're doing? Why are they being identified as these outliers? And what are these bright spot behaviors that are enabling them to succeed? So once they identify those bright spots, then they bring it to their community and they say, here's what we found. Now, how can we, like, we know that this is an important part of a, an important thing uh, for our school. How can we get others within our community to start practicing these behaviors? How might this look not just in this one singular classroom, but in all of the classrooms across our school and really engage the entire community in practicing these behaviors, not just the teachers, not just the students, but every person within their community. And from there, uh, developing a plan to monitor and evaluating the impact, not the impact um, of positive deviance, but the impact of, of uh, implementing those bright spots within their schools. And so uh, these are some just examples of what uh, the intractable problems uh, might look like. But again, um, there were as, as all of you who are familiar with schools know, no problem within one school looks the same as a problem within another school. So um, it, it, it innate, by allowing them to kind of have some focus for their intractable problem, it allowed them to, you know, find kind of collaboration and connections across the, the learning cohorts, but also be able to be really focused in what they're, we're not asking them to solve every problem that exists within their school, we're asking them to focus in on one small thing as they're starting to learn this process in their own. And like I said, we're still in the learning process. This pro this uh, this program is still uh, our, our kind of analysis and um, like synthesis of what's happened is still emergent. But so far, uh, we we we've been learning some really interesting things. We learned that yes, bright spots exist within our schools, and they are able to be uncovered via this process. We also learned that this process, this positive deviance process, can lead to a a real mindset shift in how educators and students are approaching problem solving. Just the, the fact of um, you know, doing this process over a very short sprint, a nine week sprint, um, has really shifted some of the language that educators and students are using and how they view problems, 
enabling them to kind of see each other as, as potential bright spots or problem solvers um, rather than relying on external actors or consultants to come in and tell them what to do. Um, and kind of shifting from that deficit mindset of let's look at the problem and figure out how to fix that problem to that asset-based mindset of what's already working. Here's the problem, Who, who's already solved that problem and let's go and learn from them is really freeing and really empowering for educators and for students. Uh, we also learned that this process can really advance equity in schools it, and it kind of forces um, community, school community teams to look beyond just kind of the most obvious and think about whose voices are we not hearing? Which experiences do we really need to learn from in order to make some impact and some deep change on these um, intractable problems? And the final thing is that this process works in myriad contexts. Um, we had school teams from Indonesia, from India, uh, from um, Iran, logging in at like two in the morning to do these sessions. Um, and, you know, Spanish speaking teams where, uh, you know, we were facilitating everything in English and we had, we brought in a translator, but what we learned was everything, this process uh, can, can meet the needs of any school, no matter where they are or what context they sit in, as long as they are engaging with this process and bringing in their full school community. So these are just a few key learnings. There will be many more that we would love to share as this process, as this project comes to a close. Um, and we saw some bright spots start to emerge. So um, already we're hearing from schools about ways that they're starting to implement these different bright spots, like um, new tactics for improving student agency and belonging in the classroom, different ways for grade level teams to communicate and collaborate with each other. Um, a student and parent parallel book club that was run by the school as a way to kind of deepen uh, community connections and culturally responsive teaching practices. And so we already, you know, just through the process of doing this short exercise, already saw these bright spots start to scale and disseminate. Uh, however, things are not all rosy. I will just say, I will say um, that there were all some things that we also learned about ways that we really need to think about adapting this process so that we can, um, you know, continue to uh, share this work widely across K-12 schools. So this process needs some adaptation to meet the realities and needs to uh, needs of K-12 schools. So uh, the process that the Cernans introduced, it's a great process, but, there, but schools are so unique um, and complex in, um, you know, culture and uh, kind of processes and rituals. And so there needs to be some deep adaptation to the process in order to make it easy for schools to take on and adapt in their own practices. We also learned that a sprint is just not enough time uh, to see lasting compelling results. Uh, so while we were able to get to the point of having the, the schools identify those bright spots that I shared, we haven't, we don't have enough, we haven't had enough time yet to um, kind of see the impact and see where is there some compelling data that backs up the, you know, the power of this process. The case study I shared in the beginning about Vietnam, um, they were able to have uh, see those the, the, the results of 40% of um, children improving um, after six months. We only had like two and a half months to do this with schools. So the sprint just seems like it's not enough time. Um, the last thing that we that we also learned is that the wider school community needs to be fully engaged in this process for it to work. So um, what I mean by that is it needs to not just be the students and the teachers or the school leaders. They need to involve the school support staff, the school maintenance staff, the people who work in the school cafeteria, community members, families, everyone that is engaged in the school community needs to be a part of this process in order for it to really thrive and grow. And so as we you know, can move into the next phase of our work, uh, we're really starting trying to think about how to take our learnings and take everything we've been learning alongside the schools over the last few months and start to think about how to apply this. And so this is where we're headed next. Um, we are right now in the process of capturing about 120 bright spots, um, like the ones I shared, um, from all of our participating schools so, so that we can share them widely with the different school communities. Again, these aren't plug and play bright spots, right? It's not saying like, here's 120 bright spots, use these bright spots to change your school, because these bright spots were homegrown within each of these different school contexts. So in order for them to work in a different school, they need to be adapted and they need to be thought through and when thinking about the environment that um, the school is, is kind of sitting with. So we will be releasing these bright spots widely um, for different schools. And alongside those bright spots, we're going to be developing a how-to guide for schools who are interested in using this process. So after we've had time to kind of sit with and adapt the process, we'll be releasing this um, so that folks can see this and ideally attempt to use this within their own schools when approaching problem solving.
Our final step is to design a scaling and dissemination plan for this work. So thinking about ways to monitor and evaluate impact and success, thinking about ways to you know, start this really, really small, then start to grow it from classroom to school, to district, to community, um, and, and get providing some guidance around those. So we have some exciting spaces that we're headed next, and we um, are, you know, excited to share this work as it's in its current form. So I, I think William asked a really great question early on, and I'm going to just read it. I could see how many design thinking activities are similar between exploring a problem and exploring bright spots. Are there any activities that are more specific to exploring bright spots than those of us who have been problem focused? Um, I'll start in Devin, like jump in. I do think like Devin did a nice job sort of detailing the process that we've taken on. And a lot of it has been figuring out how do we um, just tactically compress it and you know, going from a six month in-depth process that the Sternens did in Vietnam to a much more abbreviated process for trying to figure out what that could look like and how to do this over Zoom, a challenge we're all facing. So that's one piece. We also have found the key is to get a community to take this on. So this is not something where we're doing the bulk of the work. We're providing skills and tools and resources so a community can do it themselves. And I think a key thing we've learned, it's sort of like the you know, the body's immune system where it'll reject a foreign thing, but if it comes from within the, the, the community, it's more likely to be taken on. So how do you get a community to solve their own problems? It's really leaning into that. So we do not see ourselves as the problem solvers. We're the ones who are enabling the community to solve their own problems. And then really it's using the data, like following the data to find the solution. Sometimes you might just go to that the teacher that you like a whole lot or always thinks we thinks they're doing interesting stuff. What we found in our work is the data might be pointing us to someone totally unexpected who is knocking out of the park and no one knew that. So really using that discipline process to learn where a uh, point us towards we can learn. Devin, what would you add to that? Um, I think I think that that covers most of it. And I will say that with we, we've been developing um, some resources and tools uh, for during during our professional development uh, learning experience to help educators do that. And so, like Mark said, we really look to kind of the, the prior work, the prior research um, and really trying to find it's really important to kind of remove yourself as the expert in this process and just kind of enable some enable enable the edu the the folks who are doing the actual work in the field who know their community best uh, to be give them kind of some containers to be able to kind of put their knowledge versus us trying to kind of teach them where they need to go. Um, so with the toolkit release, we will be releasing a series, a set of um, tools as well. Um, and some of those are like bright spot unpacker tools and bright spot seeker tools and things that were developed in the design of this uh, program. So stay tuned uh, for some additional ones. Um, but I'll also Actually, I want to. Uh, I would love to answer. I think Pamela, you asked this uh, question around like where can I learn more about this this uh, process, and I think that kind of ties in, into William the the question that you asked as well, um, because like like we didn't invent this process, right? We are you know we were inspired and um, deep you know deeply inspired and um, educated through the work of um, um, the the Sternins and through and if you uh, I'm just posting in two. Uh, web links here. Um, one is to um, the the uh, Positive Deviance co uh, collabor Collaborative, which was developed by the Sternens as a way of kind of capturing all of their research. Um, there's there's tons of case studies on there. There's lots of data, lots of kind of uh, worksheets and tools and things that they've developed over decades of, of time utilizing this framework in uh, different different kind of capacities and, and areas. And the second uh, thing I dropped in there is the book, which was basically like our, our guiding light uh, through this, this process. And this is uh, the power of positive deviance, how unlikely innovators solve the world's toughest problem. Yes, see, Mark even has it with him at all times. He carries it with him in his back pocket. Um, but that book has, again, just is a really helpful way to kind of get started with understanding this work more deeply. And um, again, giving a lot of more explanation that we were able to give about the framework, about ways that it's worked, about tactics to try and to use as you're kind of you know, starting to, to move into this process on your own. Great. Um, one other question I think is super interesting is the one that Matt asked about um, like quality, I think it's Matt's qualitative approaches to find bright spots. And, and in, in this book, like they, there are some approaches which are quantitative, but there are also some qualitative ones. Like how can we learn through stories which members of the community seem to be being successful? And so we really moved on that and tried to figure out tools to do that. Devin, do you want to talk about some of the shadowing tools we developed? 
Yeah, and so I, I think someone else had noted in the chat that they that you know oh we could try shadowing or using like a shadowing process to to do some of this work and like you were right on that's exactly what we did. Um, I will also say is uh, what I'll also say is um, there is a there can be a challenge. Um, with kind of getting the right data, especially when you work in schools, um, not everyone has access to all of the data that you might need. So in some cases, uh, we had school teams who were actually developing their own data, capturing their own data via like, you, you know, design surveys that they designed um, to kind of track on like student senses of belonging or thinking about different ways to capture data that might not just be readily available to them or that might not even exist. Um, and in addition to that, to Mark's point, uh, we we really you know went went really deep into developing these qualitative data uh, capture tools as well. Um, so we've developed an empathy interview protocol for educators to educators and students and community members to use uh, to essentially try and like kind of pull out some different outliers um, or to help them learn more about what this problem is and why it might exist, so that it could maybe kind of like open their eyes up to something that just like the data set might not be showing them. Uh, we also have developed a new shadowing protocol uh, that helps uh, that's helped edu helped our, our, our cohorts to basically go into a classroom or into a, an, an environment where that outlier behavior has been identified and then to start to really kind of like focus their energies on like trying to see those best practices, those strategies, those bright spots. And then finally, we've developed um, focus group uh, panel protocols, uh, which is again is like an offer is a, a way for uh, community teams to have kind of like larger conversations with, um, you know, m various members of school communities, not on a one on one format, but in kind of like a group, a group conversation uh, format. And Matt, I think you raised an, a good point about like, how are you, how are people able to like, how, how can you justify the work or like show the real impact if you don't have that you know that that uh, quantitative data, and I think that's a really that that's something I think we're still we're still like working on and trying to figure out. But what I will say is that once you are able to implement the bright spot, like a bright spot behavior, even in a small scale, and then start to figure out ways to monitor that impact, just even if you're just testing it out in like a classroom or with like you know a, a team at your at your work, um, and then you're able to kind of like use that bright spot and like the resulting data to show why, how, why and how this bright spot is important, that can be a way that can lead you to, um, you know, getting more people to agree or to understand um, why this work is really important.